Good morning, church. It's good to be with you. If it's your first time here, welcome. My name is Scotty James. I'm one of the pastors here. It is my pleasure and delight to be with you on this Lord's Day. We're going to get into, into some stuff today. I want to encourage you to put your, your big boy pants on. Really, because here's the thing. It's rainy. It's easy to show up, get your coffee, put your hour in of spiritual activity and go home. But look, if you apply by faith, if you apply by faith the word that is preached today, it really can change your life. I'm not just talking about people who are new to the faith. I'm specifically talking to the older people in the faith today, those who are mature, seasoned. In my eyes, the things that we're going to unpack have some real application to our souls, can bring us to liberation. And so uh, consider what's said and uh, apply it by faith. If you have a Bible, let's go to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to be in verse 18. Genesis 2, 18 to 25. And I will read it. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping... He took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this now is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. It's very interesting to me how... Verse 25 fits into the overall narrative or the overall story of Genesis. It's the last statement that's made before the fall of humanity. And so in essence, it's this snapshot of what humanity was created to be before it all comes tumbling down. Now, if you're new here, we've been in the middle of a series asking the question, what does it mean to be fully human? Or what does it look like if we were to live in our full humanity? And we've seen that being fully human means being near to God. Adam and Eve were created to be near to God, to have relationship and fellowship with him. And so anything that's contrary to that, anything opposite of that, is subhuman. To live distant from God, to live isolated from God, to live contrary to God's will is a subhuman experience. We've also looked at how to be fully human means to be in relationship or to be near to other people. God created Adam and Eve for relationship. It's not good that man be alone. So we were created to connect with people and be in relationship with people, which means anything contrary to that is subhuman. To isolate yourself from human relationships is subhuman. To live with no dependence on people whatsoever, to try to be totally self-sufficient on your own and not need people, that's actually a subhuman experience. And here in verse 25, we see another layer of what it means to be fully human. To be fully human is to be naked and unashamed. Write that down. To be fully human, to live in the fullness of humanity that God created you to live in, is to be naked and unashamed. To be naked is to be fully exposed, to be fully revealed, to have nothing hidden, nothing unseen, everything's visible. And though the context of this is physical, no doubt, I believe it's spiritual as well. Adam and Eve were naked spiritually, they were uncovered spiritually. There was nothing in their inner person that was hidden. They were fully exposed on the soul level. So they were fully seen and fully known by God and by man. And notice, they were unashamed about it. That's the key. There was no shame. There was no self-consciousness within them. They weren't uncomfortable being exposed. There was no fear. There was no apprehension. There was no insecurities. Adam's not thinking, I wonder what Eve thinks about me. And Eve's not thinking, you know, I wonder if Adam loves me. Fully exposed and simultaneously fully secure. I believe this is the longing of the human soul. 
to be fully known and simultaneously fully secure, to be completely known, nothing to hide, and completely loved as is. Because here's the thing, every human soul deep down has this fear within them, and the fear is this, I wonder if I'm enough. If I show you who I really am, will you still love me or will you reject me? If I tell you how I really feel, will you think less of me? You know, will you still want me if I show you those other parts of my soul? Will you still want me if I'm fully authentic and fully transparent with you? See, that's not what Adam and Eve were experiencing. They experienced fully known and fully secure. They were experiencing the fullness of their humanity. And I believe that this isn't just within the context of marriage. That, that description of naked and ashamed, I believe, was supposed to mark all human relationships. It's not like they were naked and unashamed together, but then with other people there was clothes. This, this was to mark all human relationships. So naked and unashamed with their neighbors, with their future children, with their in-laws. Awkward. <laughs> naked and unashamed. Again, was supposed to mark how humans related to one another. And imagine that for a moment, living in a world where you're fully secure and you never sense any element of shame. Imagine the richness of intimacy and the depth of relationship that you would experience with your loved ones if you lived naked and unashamed. And that's what Adam and Eve had, the life that every human wants to live, and then they sinned. They stepped out of faith and into sin, and from that moment, Everything was broken. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. It says, Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Look, they went from naked and unashamed to hiding and filled with shame instantly. The intimacy the transparency that they had originally experienced was lost, again, when they stepped out of faith and into sin, and now everything is broken. There's a few elements to this brokenness that we all live in that I want you to, to consider with me today. They're not going to be on the screen, but I'd encourage you to write them down. Now, because of the fall, here's how this works. Instead of being fully known and fully secure, now security comes from hiding. In fact, write that down. Now, because of sin, Security comes from hiding. We feel shame when we're exposed, and we feel secure when we hide. You may not realize this, but much of your security, I'll bet, comes from hiding. The more exposed I am, not just physically, but emotionally, the more out there I am, the more authentic I am, the more insecure cure I feel. But the more I cover up, the more I put a mask on, or the more I pretend, the more secure I end up feeling. This drives so much of human behavior. It's why many people lie. I feel safe and secure hiding behind this lie. If I were to expose the truth, I would feel unsafe. It's why many people make excuses. I feel this sense of security and safety hiding behind these excuses. I don't want to step out behind these excuses because I'll be exposed and I, I don't feel safe. It's why many kids bully other kids. There's this safety and security they feel behind this mean persona and this mistreatment of other people. And so they're really hiding behind this, this negativity that they put toward people. Even dressing sexually or scantily clad and acting overly sexual, people think, man, they're confident. They're revealing themselves. They're not covering up, but really, it's all insecurity. They're hiding behind their body. There's something in them that feels like, I don't love who I really am, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hide behind acting sexual or hide behind dressing in these ways. The human soul finds security in hiding. And here's the next piece connected to it to write down. And hiding comes from shame. Security comes from hiding, and hiding comes from shame. Shame is a very interesting concept. If you look at the, the Bible, and you study what the word shame means, there's a few layers to it. There's a layer of fear. There's a layer of embarrassment. There's a layer of disappointment. 
And all of it, all of shame, is connected to standards. You can't miss that point. All of it's connected to standards. So if you look at, okay, what is shame? Shame is this fear, this disappointment, this embarrassment, because you don't meet a standard. There can be no shame without a standard, or at least a perceived standard. So when I perceive a standard, and I perceive I don't meet that standard, I feel shame. I don't measure up, so I gotta hide. At the very core of shame is this belief that I don't measure up. The high school kid sees all the other high school kids at their school, and I see how they dress, and I see how they talk, and I see how cool they are with their phone and the pictures that they post and how they have their boyfriend and how they cuss, and they're the standard that I should live at, and I don't measure up. I'm not good enough. I don't like this feeling. I feel ashamed. So what do I got to do? I got to hide. Well, how do you hide? I'll hide behind conforming to what they do. So I'll dress like they dress, and I'll talk like they talk, and I'll get a boyfriend like they have a boyfriend, and I'll hide because I don't measure up as I am. It's not just the high school kids. I'm single. I'm in my 30s. I'm in my 40s, and I see how everyone else my age lives. They're all married. They all have kids. They all post pictures on Instagram of their date nights and what they wear to date night and the birthday parties they're throwing for their kids, and I'm I'm not enough. They're the standard, and I don't meet that standard, and I don't like how this feels, so what do I got to do? I got to hide. I'll hide behind dating random people because that makes me feel secure. I'll hide behind putting a fake smile on my face, while everyone else lives the standard life, I'll be at home by myself, watching romantic comedies and eating bonbons. I've got to hide. Or I'm in the church, I'm middle-aged, and I have this scarlet D on my forehead that I can't get off, and everyone sees it. I'm divorced. I know the standard. I know that you're not supposed to divorce. I know what the Bible says, what God has joined together, let no man separate. I know till death do us part. I know what the pastor said. It's supposed to be about holiness, not happiness, but I failed. My marriage ended, and I'm ashamed. So what do I do? Well, I've got to hide. I've got to isolate myself from the church. I've got to get away from these people and watch online because I can't bear the fact that I have a failed marriage, and I don't measure up. We can keep going. I'm a Christian, but I struggle. I struggle with bad thoughts. I struggle with depression. I struggle with attraction to the same sex. I struggle with lustful thoughts, and Christians aren't supposed to struggle with those things. Christians aren't supposed to have those thoughts. We're supposed to not do that, and so what do I do? I, I, I got to hide. Well, how am I going to hide? I know I'll hide behind surface-level relationships. I'll show up five minutes before church so I can give the impression that I'm trying to plug in, but there's not enough time to really get to know me. And then I'll jet out right after service so that no one can really get to know me, and I'll hide behind these relationships that are shallow because deep down, I'm ashamed. There's this standard of what it means to be a believer, and I don't meet that standard. I'm not enough. It's very interesting to me how sin, or excuse me, how how shame came into the world. As soon as sin came into the world, shame came into the world. And when you understand what sin is, it makes total sense. Anybody know what sin literally is? Okay. Some would say sin means to miss the mark. If you, if you research what sin is, it's any violation of God's law or God's standard. And so sin is literally to not meet God's standard. When Adam and Eve sinned, they violated God's standard, they no longer met his standard, and so they, they, they hid. They felt the shame of not measuring up. And from that moment on, humanity has continued on this process, hiding from shame of not measuring up. And every ounce of this, listen, is subhuman. Every ounce of it. We were not created to live in shame. We were not created to hide and cover up. We were not created to 
put on fake smiles and run from relationships and conform to things and pretend all of it is subhuman. God has so much more for us. And so what are we supposed to do? We deal with the shame. How do we get out of this shame? I see three possible remedies. I encourage you to write them down. One is to meet the standard. If you want to remove shame, and shame's based on a standard that you don't meet, well, one way you can remove the shame is to to meet the standard. This is actually a, a positive consequence of shame. If there's a healthy standard for me to meet, and I'm able but I'm not willing to meet it, that shame can propel me to meet a standard that's good for me. I'll give you a biblical example of this. Write down 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 5, looking at verses 1 to 2. Should be on the screen, but I'm not sure. All right, cool, it is. All right, it says, Paul says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of fellowship the man who has been doing this? Okay, pause there. So there's a man who's in the church who's clearly living in sin. He's sleeping with his father's wife. And so any culture, incest or sexual relationships with family is a a clear no-no. And they were proud about it. They were bragging about this. So Paul writes this letter and he says, what are y'all doing? Like you have a man sleeping with his father's wife, which is probably his stepmother. Otherwise, he would have said sleeping with his mother. Still bad. So you're you're sleeping with your stepmother, and you guys are proud about this? You should be ashamed. You should have kicked this guy out of the church and let him feel the consequence of this. Okay, keep reading. Look at verse 9. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and the swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave the world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, claims to be a Christian, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer or a drunkard or a swindler. Listen, don't even eat with them. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside the church? He goes on to say in verse 13, God will judge those outside the church, expel the immoral brother. So this is super unpopular. I bet you've never heard this preached in a church. To expel the immoral brother? This is not practiced at all, but when you understand what God is saying, it makes more sense. The instruction is that if someone claims to be a Christian, but is living in sexual sin, unrepentant, unwilling to consider it sexual sin, you got to kick them out of the church. I'm having an affair, and I'm not stopping. I'm sleeping around, and I'm not stopping. Paul says, disassociate with them. Shame them. Let them feel the shame. Well, how wrong? You can't do that. You can't shame someone. Shame is all bad. You're supposed to love them. Why would you shame? Are you shaming because you're better than them? Are you shaming to put them down? No, you're shaming them to build them up. It's supposed to be about redemption. It's supposed to be about restoration. God has a standard. You have to walk in sexual purity and call yourself a believer. And if you're not meeting that standard and you're not willing to seek any help, You're not willing to repent. You're not willing to try to change this. You're just going to stay stuck in your sin and everybody has to accept it. Disassociate with them. Why? So that they can feel the shame of that and hope that they might repent. When they are no longer a part of the body of Christ and they're not experiencing the fellowship and the intimacy and the relationship, hopefully them feeling that will cause them to say, I don't want this anymore. What am I doing? I need to repent. It's meant to restore them. And so shame can actually be used in a beneficial way if it helps you meet a godly standard that you're able to meet. I'll give you another very simple example. I'm a kid, I don't study for a test, and I fail the test. And the teacher gives me a big red F on the paper. Well, how dare she? That's shameful. Well, you can look at it that way, or you can take that F and study next time and meet the standard that you're able to meet. The shame can build you up to where you actually should be at. I'll give you another example. I show up late for work all the time, and my boss gives me a referral. How dare they? That brings shame on me. Yeah? So what you could do is whine, or you could get up early, 
get your behind in the car and get to work on time like you're able to do. And so shame can be used to help you meet a standard that you're able to meet. One way to eliminate shame is to meet the standard that you're able to meet. Here's another way, though. A second way to remove shame is to remove the standard. Write that down. You can remove shame by removing the standard. If shame comes from not meeting a standard, you can remove it, and now the shame is gone. This can be super liberating, but it's really, really difficult to do. If you notice, when it comes to shame, everyone experiences shame except babies. Babies don't experience shame. Butt naked, don't care. Pee on you, poop on you, vomit on you, and smile at you simultaneously. I remember one of our kids, you don't know, we have, we have six kids, one of our kids, a friend was playing with them, and they had him up in the air, you know, ha, la, 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 la. And the kid spit up and went straight in the person's mouth, bloop, right in their mouth. And the kid didn't apologize. They just smiled and went on. Babies have no shame. But as babies get a little bit older, things start to change a little bit. When that baby becomes a toddler, you start seeing some, some trends of shame entering their life. Now when someone new comes over the house, they're a little concerned. They're a little shy now. Now they're af maybe afraid to, to try new things. Still pretty shameless, but some threads of shame. And they get a little older, and shame starts coming a little bit more strong. Now they cover their private parts. Now they close doors when they go to the bathroom. Now they're embarrassed if they wet the bed. Now they're becoming more skilled in hiding. And then by the time they become a teenager, it's so full-blown and so rampant that shame covers their entire existence. Shame touches every facet of their life, how they dress, how they look, how they talk, and they proceed like this for the next 20 years of their life, sort of dictated and formed by shame. And they reach a certain status in life, maybe they get married or maybe they, they reach a certain space in their career, and the shame starts to go the opposite way again. They seem to stop caring about what people think. They care less about how they look. They let that beer bellies start coming out a little further, and those love handles start forming. They start saying corny jokes and watching corny shows and dressing like their parents used to dress, right? Until they're later in life, and now they don't care what anyone thinks. And they say awkward, inappropriate comments all the time. So what happened? That's sort of the journey of shame of the majority of people. And that journey of shame, listen, that journey of shame was a journey of awareness of standards. When it was a baby, they felt no shame because they knew no standards. No standards of God and no standards of man. Shameless. But then as they became a little kid, they started becoming more aware of standards. More aware of God's standard, but more specifically, more aware of, of human standards. And then by the time you're a teenager, you're filled with shame in every facet of your life because there's a standard for every facet of your life. How you look, there's a standard for. How you talk, there's a standard for. How you think, what your value is, there's a standard for every facet of life. And now you keep asking the question in every area, am I good enough? Do I measure up? There's a standard for everything. Here's the thing, if you want to overcome shame, you're going to have to start eliminating some of these standards. If you want to overcome shame, you've got to stop getting your standard of beauty from TV. You've got to stop getting your standard of value from social media. You've got to start getting, stop getting your standard of, of worth and importance from the things that the world says. Living according to the standards of the world will only bring you disappointment and shame. You need not be concerned with what the world says about you. The only standard that you must live to are the standards that God has put for you. That is it. But when you live according to what the world says and you value the standards that they have, you will be ridden with shame. I guarantee it. Take that home with you. If you want to get rid of all the shame, you've got to start eliminating the unnecessary, unhealthy, man-made standards. 
I wonder, I wonder if there are some of us in here today that need to take this and apply this by faith. Some of us, they need to say, you know what? I need to eliminate some of these man-made standards that I'm living by. I need to stop getting my value, stop getting my worth from what I see on social media, what I see on TV, what I hear from my coworkers. I wonder if I need to be more focused on what the Word of God says about standards. So you can remove the standards by living up to it, by eliminating it. But what happens if you can't do either? What happens if you can't eliminate the standard and you can't live up to it? That was the case of Adam and Eve. They couldn't just, when they sinned, they violated the standard of God. They couldn't just eliminate that. And they couldn't just live up to it. And so what do you do in that space? Here's the third way you eliminate shame. You eliminate shame by receiving grace despite your inability to meet the standard. Again, how you get rid of shame? You must receive grace. Receive grace despite your inability to meet that standard. You can write down Romans 3.23. The Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know what that means? All have not made God's standard. No one measures up. Everyone falls short. So what do you do? Jew or Gentile, everyone falls short of God's standard. So what do you do? You receive grace despite your inability. And the beautiful thing is that that is exactly what the gospel is all about. Receiving grace despite your inability to meet God's standard. Write down Romans chapter 3. Romans 3, uh, 9 to 12. Paul says, what shall we conclude? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. We've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Pause there. No one is righteous. Are you seeing it? No one meets the standard. Everyone misses the mark. Everyone stands unworthy and rightfully ashamed in front of this holy and righteous God. But look at what it continues to say. Verse 20. Therefore, because of that, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. He just eliminated option number one. You can't meet the standard on your own. That's, that's not an option to remove your shame. So what are you supposed to do? We'll keep reading. Verse 21 now. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. Verse 22. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Listen, because all sin and because all fall short of reaching God's mark, and all are deserving of wrath, God satisfied that penalty by sending his son to pay the price on your behalf so that if you would believe in him through faith, meaning trust in him, meaning surrender to him, meaning to, to depend on him for your righteousness, God would graciously forgive your sin, remove your sin, remove your shame, and make you right with him. You couldn't meet the standard, so God met you in that space and gave you grace. Listen, you are saved, okay? Your shame is removed. You meet God's standard by grace, through faith in Christ. This is the gospel. This is the good news. You fell short of God's standard, but instead of moving away from you, God moved towards you and brought grace to you in that space, despite your inability, and gave you the opportunity to rediscover your humanity, to be naked and ashamed once again in front of this holy and righteous God. I want to challenge you this week. Seriously, ask God this. God, 
please make me aware of how much of my life is ruled by shame. I double dog dare you to ask that question. Seriously. I've been asked that question for three days. It is scary how much I'm realizing, you know what? I'm doing this because of shame. I'm doing this because there's some sort of standard that I'm trying to live up to that I'm, I've made up and I've adopted. Ask God how much of your life is being led or ruled by shame, and then what are you supposed to do with that? You got three options. God, I have this shame. Am I supposed to meet a standard? Do I need to start going to work on time? Do I need to start being nicer to someone? Do I need to start studying for my test? Do I need to start doing a better job? That shame you're experiencing might be because you're just not giving the effort that you should be giving. We've got to be able to own that and say, yeah, okay, I've got to make some changes. Do you need to step up to a standard? Or, number two, do you need to eliminate a standard? Do I feel bad about myself because I'm living according to worldly standards that social media has given me or that my secular friends have given me or that the world has given me? Do I need to stop caring about these things? God, expose this to me. Help me. Help me eliminate the standard. Or number three, do I need to just receive grace despite my inability? Lord, help me know. Have I put my faith in Christ? Have I received the free gift of salvation through faith that only comes through, through, through faith in Christ? I talked to you guys a few weeks ago. I, was talking, I won't get too much into it, but I was talking about that drive home. You guys remember? Feeling ashamed. There was a standard that I hadn't lived up to. And in that moment, God, I believe, gave me that reassurance, it's okay. But I didn't meet the standard. True, but it's okay. My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. Reflect upon your life. What response to shame do you need to have? I'll bet you there might be layers of all three. You might need to start stepping up in certain ways. You might need to start eliminating certain standards. You might need to start receiving grace despite your inability in some ways. God is the, the peace that holds all of life together. And so when you get right with God, that shame that you're controlled by will slowly begin to peel off. It starts with getting right with God. So to be fully human, to live in the fullness of your humanity, is to be naked and unashamed before God. We looked at the unashamed part, but what about the naked part? What does that look like, and how do we recover that? You know what I'm about to say. That's right. We'll find out next week. But take, take this. Don't just go out and go to lunch. Like, have your lunch, but pray about this. Ask, have the courage to ask God to make you aware of how much of shame is ruling your life, and then may God deliver us of these things so that we can walk in the fullness of humanity we were created to live in. Amen? All right, let's pray. Oh, God. God, help us. We settle for a human experience that is less than what we were created for. Help us, God. Help us. We want to live naked and unashamed before you and before man and before ourselves. We are so used to shame, we don't even recognize it anymore. It's just our reality. But there is so much more you have for us. Oh, what would it be like to live shamelessly? To never have to worry about not measuring up or not being accepted. I believe we can actually move towards that. Help us, God. Help us apply these things through faith. Help us, God. Help us. Reveal to us if there's standards that we've adopted that are just stupid. Help us let go of them. Help us realize if there's healthy standards that we need to step up to and repent of and move towards. And Lord, help us realize if we need to just receive grace. Help us become these things we've heard, Lord. We love you. Thank you for how good you are to us. Thank you for your patience for us. Thank you for moving towards us when you didn't have to. So good. Thank you, God. We love you. Everybody sit together. Amen. Let's all stand and give God some praise before we go.